Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're exploring some uh, really quite groundbreaking developments, stuff coming right from the forefront of HIV research. Yeah, our source material details this recent clinical trial. It's out of South Africa. And it's yielding, well, incredibly promising results, pushing us closer maybe to a potential HIV cure. So our mission for this deep dive, we want to really understand the approach they took in this trial, this innovative approach. We'll unpack exactly what these results mean and importantly explore why this represents such a significant, um, really exciting leap forward in the fight against HIV, even if it's just for, you know, a segment of participants right now. Get ready for a, I think, a really compelling look at the details. These were presented at the 2025 Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections. That was in San Francisco. Okay, let's dive right in then. The headline that's emerging from this groundbreaking South African HIV cure trial, it's a truly powerful statement. Get this, 20% of the trial participants have remained off antiretroviral therapy RT, that is, and are virally suppressed. After one and a half years, for anyone familiar with HIV management, you know, that's just, it's a dramatic shift from the norm. Oh, absolutely. What's truly fascinating here is just how fundamentally this challenges our, well, our traditional understanding of HIV for decades, right? The gold standard has been lifelong AJ, wow. daily medication taken indefinitely just to keep the virus in check. So the very notion, the idea of participants remaining virally suppressed without any medication for such a long time, it isn't just a slight improvement. It signals a, you know, a significant shift in thinking how we think about HIV remission. And this trial, it explicitly aimed to tackle that persistent challenge, the viral reservoir, those hidden bits of HIV lying dormant in the body's cells. They make a full cure so elusive. So the goal was either to eliminate these reservoirs or maybe more realistically reduce them enough, enough so the person's own immune system could kind of step up and maintain control. Without needing those daily pills, it's really about empowering the body, isn't it? To achieve something we maybe thought wasn't possible. Okay, so if lifelong RT is standard and this viral reservoir is the big hurdle, what was this innovative treatment approach, the one that lets some participants go off their meds? It's called combination immunotherapy. Can you walk us through the steps? How did it actually work for these people? It sounds uh, pretty complex. Yeah, absolutely. The trials method, it was carefully orchestrated, a multi-phase approach. First, critical step, initiating RT very, very soon after participants acquired HIV. That early intervention is just paramount because the sooner you get the virus under control, the less chance it has to establish those deep, persistent, you know, really stubborn viral reservoirs, those hideouts in the cells. Right, minimizes the latency. Exactly. So once the virus was effectively suppressed by the RT, meaning their viral load was undetectable, that's a key milestone, right? Yeah. Shows the virus is at super low levels, can't be detected, can't be transmitted. Then they move to phase two. This involved giving powerful immune boosters. Immune boosters, okay. Yeah, and these weren't just general immune stimulants. They were specific immune modulating agents designed to sort of re-educate and rearm the body's own natural defenses against HIV. Ah, uh, okay. To sharpen the immune response. Precisely. The idea was to enhance the immune system's ability to recognize and target any remaining virus or cells hiding the virus with more precision, more effectiveness, and only then under extremely close medical supervision. And I have to stress this, this is a highly controlled clinical setting, not something anyone should ever try on their own. The risks are significant viral rebound, drug resistance. It's absolutely critical point. So under that supervision, participants cautiously stopped their RT. This treatment interruption phase let the researchers see if their bodies, you know, with these boosted immune systems could actually maintain control on their own. This careful phased approach was just it was absolutely key, key to the method and key for patient safety. Now, here's where the story gets another layer, I think, a really significant one. This wasn't just any HIV cure trial. It was the first of its kind conducted on the African continent. And remarkably, it specifically involved 20 women as participants. Why is that specific detail so incredibly important? In the context of global health research, the whole HIV fight. Yeah, this brings up a really, really important question about equity about representation in science. It's something we don't always talk about enough. Women, globally, they bear a disproportionately heavy burden of the HIV epidemic, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yet, historically, they've often been, well, significantly underrepresented in cure-related research. Meaning the findings might not apply as well to them. Potentially, yes. It means many breakthroughs, while valuable, might not fully account for possible physiological differences, how women's bodies respond to the virus or to treatments, things like hormones or different inflammatory responses. So including 20 
many women in this trial, the very first HIV cure trial on the continent. It's not just symbolic, it's a scientific imperative. It helps ensure the insights we gain are relevant, they're applicable, they're optimized for a population that's profoundly impacted by HIV. It directly addresses that historical imbalance in science pushes for more inclusive research, research that reflects the global reality of the epidemic. And the results for these specific women were quite striking, weren't they? Not just a general statistic, but individuals showing these really sustained outcomes. Yes, indeed. The individual stories within that data are powerful. The trial results show that 30% of participants, okay, so that's six out of the 20 women, were able to successfully stay off HIV treatment for nearly a year. Wow, nearly a year, RT-free, that's huge in itself. It is a significant victory, but it gets even more encouraging, 20% of that initial group. So for participants, they remained off treatment until the trial officially ended at 55 weeks. Okay, over a year then. Exactly. And what's really compelling, what hints at the long-term potential, is that these four individuals, they're still being rigorously monitored by the research team. They've continued without medication for an average of 1.5 years after the trial finished. A year and a half, on average, post-trial. Still off meds. That's right. They're showing sustained viral control without daily medication. Their immune systems have, it seems, really taken over the job. So for these specific individuals, yeah, it's an ongoing success story. And it offers critical clues into what a functional cure might look like. Okay, so it wasn't 100% across all 20 participants. Four achieved that sustained remission. Mm -hmm. But Professor Dumbi Andungu is one of the directors at the Africa Health Research Institute. He still emphasized this is a significant development in HIV cure research. Yeah. Given it was four people, why is a partial success like this still seen as so groundbreaking? What's the bigger picture meaning? Well, if you connect this to how scientific discovery actually works, a partial success like this is, frankly, a goldmine of information. It means, sure, the treatment didn't work for everyone, but the knowledge we gained from the individuals it did work for, incredibly valuable. Like a proof of concept. Exactly. Think of it less as a percentage, more as proof it's possible. For those four participants, their bodies did something extraordinary. So now scientists can intensely study how. How did these specific individuals manage to control the virus on their own? You look at their unique genetics, their immune responses before and after, how their viral reservoirs might have differed. Digging into the biology of success. Precisely. This detailed understanding of the mechanisms, the biological reasons for sustained control, it gives us critical insights. It helps answer fundamental questions. What biomarkers predict success? Which specific immune cells or pathways are key? And that understanding will undoubtedly help scientists develop better strategies, more targeted, maybe more personalized HIV cure approaches down the line. It's about learning from every single data point, every partial success, refining future treatments, building towards something bigger. That's how all major medical breakthroughs really start, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And this trial also proved something really crucial. Beyond the treatment science itself, it sends a powerful message about where this research happened. Oh, absolutely. And this point just cannot be overstated. This trial demonstrably proved that highly complex, really cutting-edge HIV cure research can be successfully conducted in resource-limited settings, mm -hmm. like Durban, South Africa. Why is that so vital? Well, for several reasons. First, the global burden of HIV is disproportionately high in regions like Sub-Saharan Africa. So the need for effective treatments and ultimately cures is arguably greatest right there. Second, conducting this kind of advanced research locally does more than just get data. It fosters scientific capacity building within those regions. You're training local researchers, developing infrastructure, strengthening health systems. Right, building local expertise. Exactly. And it helps ensure that the solutions developed are, you know, culturally appropriate, logistically feasible for the places they're most needed. It highlights the vital importance of including African populations, not just as participants, but as integral partners, as leaders in global science, ensuring solutions are developed and tested where they'll have the biggest impact not just relying on research done elsewhere. It's about global equity in science, really, empowering local expertise. And just for anyone curious about who was behind this, it wasn't just one group. The research was a major, truly global team effort led by the HIV Pathogenesis Program at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the Africa Health Research Institute, the Reagan Institute of Mass General, MIT and Harvard, and Gilead Sciences, Inc. A real powerhouse collaboration. Yeah, a truly global scientific partnership tackling a global challenge. It shows what can be achieved when brilliant minds from different places come together with a shared goal. So what does this all mean for you, our listener? 
This deep dive into the South African HIV cure trial, I think it demonstrates that we are, we're not just hoping anymore, we're actively inching closer. Closer to a world where HIV might not require lifelong medication. It's a testament to the power of global scientific collaboration, the meticulous work of clinical trials, and the absolutely vital importance of including diverse populations in research, especially those most affected by a health challenge. It's a reminder, really, that science is a journey, and every step, even what looks like a partial success, is actually a significant stride forward. And maybe this raises an important question for you to think about. As science keeps pushing the boundaries, tackling these complex global health changes, what role do you think this kind of collaborative research will play, especially research actively conducted in and driven by these resource-limited settings? What role will that play in solving other major global health issues? Because the lessons from this HIV trial about partnership, about localized expertise, about inclusive research, they really extend far beyond just this one disease. Thank you.